July 10th, 2013. A typically hot and humid summer afternoon in Singapore. But this day would quickly become one that the island nation won't forget in a hurry. It all started with a man whose belt had somehow become attached to the bottom of a moving car. He was dragged face down along the rough asphalt of a major road in front of horrified onlookers, before becoming dislodged outside a busy rail station. But a closer inspection of the man revealed there was more to this story than a tragic accident, and he'd left behind a vital clue, a bloody trail for police to follow. Stretching for over a kilometre through the busy streets of Coven, it led to a second brutal crime scene, a 54-hour manhunt, and an unexpected culprit. Hello and welcome to the little shop of crime. I'm Steve, thanks for popping in. We're staying in 2013 this week with a case that rocked Singapore. So anyone from that neck of the woods will probably be pretty familiar with it, but otherwise I don't think it's that well known. I'd never heard of it and I couldn't believe what I was reading once I started down the rabbit hole of this one. So let's investigate. This is The Coven Killer. We're off on our first trip together to the country slash city slash island nation of Singapore. And we better make the most of it, because Singapore isn't exactly synonymous with crime. In fact, it's revered as one of the cleanest, safest places on the planet. And that's partly down to a culture of respect coupled with a low tolerance for crime. Those who tread on the wrong side of the law are punished with severity there. But keep your nose clean and you can enjoy this cultural melting pot. It's a shopper's paradise with a myriad of markets and malls and multicultural cuisines. Five and a half million people help make it one of the densest populations on Earth, with a skyline that's an impressive symphony of modern architecture fused with green space unlike anywhere else. I mean, look at it. It's beautiful. Singapore's neighbourhoods and districts are woven together with a modern and efficient network of trains known as the Mass Rapid Transport System, or MRT for short. And they get busy, really busy. After all, there's that dense population to move around. And outside one of these busy MRT stations is precisely where today's story begins, in the northeastern neighbourhood of Coven on a humid Wednesday in the summer of 2013. It was 3.50 in the afternoon. Drivers and pedestrians along a busy main road were horrified to see a man whose belt had become caught on the underside of a car. He was being dragged face down along the road surface as the car weaved in and out of traffic. People were screaming, 15 or 20 cars honked their horns, and a motorcyclist even pulled alongside the car and started banging on its window. But the driver just looked straight ahead and kept on driving. Eventually the man became dislodged right outside Coven's busy MRT station, in front of shocked commuters. Paramedics and police arrived quickly, but there was nothing they could do. His injuries were just too severe, and so the 42-year-old man was pronounced dead at the scene. And that 42-year-old was later identified as Tan Chi Hyung, a married father to two young children, and the owner of a small electronics business. Chi Hyung was described as a hard-working, responsible and dedicated family man. The friction injuries to his face, torso and limbs caused by being dragged along the road surface were catastrophic, the likes of which his pathologist said he'd never seen before. But they weren't the only injuries he found. Tan Chi Hyung had also suffered 20 knife-related injuries too, many of which were stab wounds to his neck, head and chest. He also had a number of visible defensive injuries to his forearms. An 8 centimetre neck wound is what killed him. It severed three major blood vessels. In fact, it was so severe that he was almost certainly already dead, or at least close to it, by the time he was dragged underneath the car. Tan Chi Hyung was the eldest of three children to Tan Boon Sin, Tan being the family name which comes first in Singapore. And it wasn't long before police ran the license plates and discovered that it was actually Boon Sin's car that had dragged his son through the busy Coven streets. But at first, investigators had no idea they were dealing with a murder case. It all looked like the result of a tragic accident. Still, they were keen to learn what had happened, and it turned out Chi Hyung had left a glaring clue. 
a trail of blood marking out the path he'd taken along the major Upper Sarangoon Road. So they followed the blood trail, and they followed it, and then they followed it, for over a kilometre. It led right here, to the driveway of 14J Hillside Drive. Looks idyllic, doesn't it? But what they found there was far from it. It turned out that the driver of the car couldn't have been Chi Hyung's father, because he was found dead inside his own home. The 67-year-old body of Tan Boon Sin was found with 27 similar knife-related injuries. 12 of them were stab wounds to the neck, chest and head, and he too had defensive injuries, to his arms and fingers. His cause of death was an incision in his neck, and a 13 centimetre deep wound in his chest. He was married and had lived alone with his wife inside the home for 10 years before his death. He owned and ran this car workshop, not too far from his house. I know it's customary to say nice things about the recently deceased, but from all of the statements I read about him from his employees, he did seem like an all-round nice guy. Apparently, he didn't smoke, he didn't gamble, he didn't womanise. The only thing he liked doing was fishing. He wasn't a violent man. He certainly didn't seem like the kind of guy who'd mix with the types of people who'd commit such a heinous crime as this. It was only now that police publicly declared the case a double murder, and the story exploded in Singapore. This sort of thing almost never happened, and the media was rife with speculation. As the day went on, the case began to stir up quite some commotion. Crowds gathered outside Tan Boon Sin's home, and Upper Serangoon Road was gridlocked as the investigation went on. Here's what they'd found out. Boon Sin was last seen at 1pm when he left his car workshop. He said he had to grab some things from his safety deposit box over at Certis Cisco. His son Chi Hyung also left work early, a couple of hours later. He left his office light on, which usually meant he wouldn't be gone for long. Bloody sock prints were found in Boon Sin's home. They showed a likely male walking around the house in what they described as a linear path. Two witnesses saw Chi Hyung leaving the house. He was seen clutching his neck before he collapsed in the driveway. The suspect was a man in his thirties. Both witnesses saw him reverse over Chi Hyung and drag him towards Upper Serangoon Road. Because the father, Boon Sin, had been to withdraw a large sum of money, newspapers were already declaring it a likely business dispute. But police weren't buying it. His car workshop was doing a roaring trade, and his son certainly had no money issues. So what exactly had lured both men from their work and to their deaths? The following day, Boon Sin's car was found abandoned on an industrial estate about 6 kilometers from Coven MRT station. Somebody had spotted the silver Toyota Camry with blood spatter along one side of it, and alerted police. It was towed away to be swept for evidence. The manhunt was on, and using CCTV, eyewitness accounts, and just some bloody good detective work, it didn't take long for police to learn the suspect's identity. And that's basically my way of saying I don't know exactly how they did it. It was a high-profile case, and as far as I can tell, they've never disclosed it. But this is the man they were looking for. Iskandar bin Ramat the 34-year-old suspected killer of the beloved father and son. They now knew who he was, they just needed to know where. And actually, that didn't take long either. Police managed to trace the movements of his Vespa scooter, and discovered he'd fled Singapore on it, pootling across the Johor Singapore Causeway into Malaysia at 11pm on the evening of the murders. Two days later, at 9.30pm on July 12th, the law finally caught up with Iskander, as plain-clothed Malaysian officers observed him eating here, a popular seafood buffet restaurant not far from the border. He's the one in the cap. Iskander was promptly surrounded, arrested, and shipped off back to Singapore, marking the end of a 54-hour manhunt. Following the arrest, Singapore's Commissioner of Police made a public statement, and the identity of the suspect came as a bit of a shock to the people of Singapore. Today is a sad day for the police. Today, we have arrested a murder suspect who is also a policeman. That was the opening statement of the police commissioner at a news conference addressing the Coven murders. He said learning the identity of the suspect was a painful one. When I was first told that the murder suspect could be one of our own, my initial reaction was disbelief, swiftly followed by anger and anguish. This was the same gamut of emotions police investigators had to deal with in the last few days as they pursued the suspect. The fact that the suspect is a police officer gave my investigators 
even greater resolve and determination to solve this case. I commend them for going about their duties in a thoroughly professional manner and for being ultimately successful in capturing their target. We have now captured Officer Eskander and we will prosecute him to the greatest and maximum extent. And he wasn't just any old police officer. Iskandar bin Ramat was a senior staff sergeant with 14 years experience under his belt, having joined at the tender age of 20. Pretty much his entire adult life had been spent in the police force, and by all accounts, he was good at his job. He'd picked up numerous commendations en route to his senior position. Iskandar lived in a modest three-room apartment with his parents and sister, who he supported financially. His passion, vintage bicycles and scooters, much like his getaway vehicle. Iskandar bin Ramat was formally charged with the crimes, and he didn't deny being responsible for their deaths. In fact, he helped investigators reenact the murders at the crime scene. Meanwhile, the funerals of both tan gentlemen took place on July 16th. It was a heartbreaking celebration of two lives cut short. More than 100 relatives and friends attended. They fawned over Chi Hyung's three-year-old son, who asked his family why Papa and Gong Gong had to die at the same time. His parting words to his father were, Bye, Daddy, as his coffin was placed inside the hearse. His older brother drew this picture, an empty sofa, to place in the coffin. It was all too much to bear for Chi Hyung's wife. His younger brother, 39-year-old Tan Chi Wee, made the tearful and solemn promise to help take care of his nephews as if they were his own children. Boon Sin's wife was too distraught to take part in the Buddhist funeral rites. She instead sobbed into the arms of a relative, forced to come to terms with the death of her husband of 40 years and of her eldest child. Ten days later, Iskandar underwent a full psychiatric evaluation inside Changi Prison's medical complex. Examiners found no signs whatsoever of any mental illness, nor did he make an attempt to lean on that. He was fit to plead, and he told his lawyers that he wanted to plead not guilty, and claim trial to all of the charges against him. He would take the case to court. So what happened? How could an otherwise decent cop end up committing a violent double murder? Well, for answers, we have to go back a bit. Like with so many cases, it boiled down to money. Iskandar got married in 2003, and subsequently took out loans for a house, for renovation work on that house, and for a car, amounting to a few hundred thousand in Singapore dollars. But the marriage quickly fell apart, and he got divorced just two years later. He sold the property and the car to scrape off some of the debt, and that's when he went to live in the apartment with his parents and sister. But by the time of the murders, he was still neck deep in debt and facing bankruptcy. He owed the bank almost 62,000 Singapore dollars, which is worth about 46,000 US dollars, not taking into account inflation. Now, in Singapore, all civil servants have to make an annual declaration that they're not what the country calls financially embarrassed, meaning they're not facing bankruptcy or struggling with debt. He didn't make this declaration, his bosses caught wind of it, and disciplinary hearings were held against him. He was demoted, reassigned to administrative duties, and barred from carrying any firearms. They gave him just three months to clear his debts. Iskandar offered the bank an out-of-court settlement of $50,000, and they accepted it. The snag? He'd have to pay in full by July 11th to avoid bankruptcy, the day after the murders. He told his superiors that he was going to borrow the money from his cousin. He didn't even have a cousin, and he had less than $400 in the bank. But he'd already begun to hatch a plan. He remembered a case he'd worked on the previous November, involving an elderly man who'd reported a theft from his safety deposit box. Cash amounting to $45,000 and some gold coins were missing. That man was Tan Boon Sin. They didn't actually meet at the time, but on a whim, Iskandar took home the police report, which stated that over 200,000 remained in the box. But it wasn't until July 8th, two days before the bankruptcy deadline and the murders, that Iskandar decided to put a plan into action, to rob the man of his savings in order to pay off his debts. On the day of the crimes, Iskandar contacted Tan Boon Sin at work with some worrying news. He introduced himself as Rahman, an intelligence officer hoping to catch a would-be thief in action. A thief who he said was planning to rob Boon Sin's safety deposit box again. But there was no thief, other than Iskandar himself. 
And of course he had the means to appear believable. He was a real cop after all. Tam Boon Sin left work early to meet the officer, who wore a convincing outfit, brought along his warrant card, security pass and the actual police report from the previous theft. And for good measure he'd hired a black Nissan Sunny, more professional than his Vespa. He'd also cut the earpiece from a pair of earphones and wore an electronic anti-snoring bracelet. It would make a convincing high-tech walkie-talkie. There was absolutely no reason for Boon Sin not to believe he was legitimate. He'd also brought along a cheap dummy surveillance camera, which he urged Boon Sin to substitute with the valuables in his box, so they could catch the would-be thief red-handed. Iskander waited in the rental car close to Sirtis Sisko. He couldn't risk being seen on CCTV. Boon Sin soon returned with over $200,000 in a small orange bag, and Iskander insisted he escort him home, since he was carrying so much money. He hopped in Boon Sin's car, and on the way he pretended to be talking to his partner via his bracelet. He was apparently following in a vehicle behind. Proceeding back to house, over. The plan was so far going without a hitch. They arrived at Boon Sin's house at about 3pm. Iskander told him his partner had become delayed in traffic, so naturally the older man invited him inside to wait and politely offered him a drink. Iskander spied the bag of valuables in reaching distance by the stairs, but there was a snag. Boonsin had closed the electronic gates, blocking Iskander's escape route. Iskander asked him to open them while he went out for a smoke, and requested that the gates be left open, since his partner would be arriving shortly. Boonsin happily obliged. According to Iskander, when he went back into the house he asked to use the bathroom, where he psyched himself up to grab the bag and run, but when he came out, the bag had been moved. He began to panic and told Boon Sin that the thief had been caught and that they should return the valuables to the safety deposit box ASAP. Boon Sin agreed and went to the kitchen to make a quick phone call. We now know that this was to his son Chi Hyung who was at work in his office. Once he'd finished on his call he suddenly confronted Iskandar with a knife and accused him of being a swindler. He said he'd opened the CCTV camera and seen that it was a fake with no batteries in it. Boon Sin allegedly then lunged at him with the knife, and Iskandar tried to grab it, causing a deep cut to his palm which you can see here. He eventually managed to wrestle the knife from the older man, and a frenzied fight broke out. Boon Sin held on to him, and Iskandar just kept on stabbing wildly, but the older man's strength wouldn't give in, so Iskandar just kept thrusting the blade into him until his body went limp, and he eventually collapsed on the floor beside the house organ. Police found the orange bag a week later, Boon Sin had hidden it deep within a storeroom, stuffed underneath a chair, evidence of his suspicion of Iskander. As Boon Sin was dying on the floor, Iskander heard someone shout, Pa! He turned to see Chi Hyung coming at him with his clenched fists raised. Iskander apparently forgot he was carrying the knife, and in an attempt to defend himself he ended up swinging it wildly, before he became engaged in another sudden and ferocious fight. After suffering multiple severe injuries, Chi Hyung ran out of the house. A neighbour's CCTV later showed that just three minutes passed between the time Chi Hyung entered the house and the time he was run over. In a state of panic, Iskander grabbed Boon Sin's keys and jumped into his car to use it as a getaway vehicle. What he apparently didn't realise was that Chi Hyung had collapsed right behind it. Iskander reversed over him, before speeding away from the scene towards Coven MRT station. He heard all the honking and shouting, and assumed it was in response to blood on the side of the car. He had no idea Chi Hyung's belt had become caught, and that he was dragging him along the area's busiest road. He ditched the car at an industrial area of Yunos, went home, got washed and changed, and packed the knife, the bloody clothes, and Boon Sin's car key into a plastic bag. He then drove to East Coast Park and threw the bag into a canal. Despite 30 officers spending more than 5 hours searching the section of canal, the weapon was never recovered. Iskander requested urgent leave for that evening shift at the police station, before he returned the rental car, hopped on his scooter and crossed the causeway into Malaysia at 11pm. He then sought treatment for his hand injury. Of course, he had to lie to the doctor. He said it was the result of falling from his scooter and colliding with a lamppost. In Malaysia, he checked into the Tun Hotel in Danga Bay, not far from the border, where he spent the next couple of days. He then sent a message to his superior, informing him that because of his debts he'd run away to Malaysia and was quitting the force for good. This was just an hour before he was arrested. It took more than two years to prepare the case for trial, 
mostly because there was just so much DNA evidence to analyse and process, and more than a hundred witnesses were scheduled to testify, although only 17 ended up taking the stand, all for the prosecution. It began on October 20th, 2015 at the High Court of Singapore. Iskander's version of events that led up to the fatal incidents was never disputed. It centred not around whether he was guilty of killing them, he admitted that, but whether or not it was premeditated, or whether it was in self-defence following a robbery gone wrong. If found guilty, he faced a mandatory death sentence. If not, he was looking at a maximum of life imprisonment and a caning, for culpable homicide. The trial centred around the origin of the murder weapon. Iskander's defence argued that there was no concrete evidence that he'd armed himself in advance, and that the knife had likely come from Tambun Sin's kitchen, where he made the call to his son shortly before he confronted Iskander. If he'd planned to kill, he would have done it straight away. The plan was only ever to grab the bag, run to Upper Serangoon Road, and then flag down a taxi. Iskander's lawyers maintained that the slice to his hand is evidence that he attempted to grab the blade from his attacker. They also attempted to make use of his psychiatric report, which indicated that he didn't have a propensity for violence, and reacted in a state of panic, although these findings were all ultimately drawn from Iskander's version of events. When cross-examined, Iskander was able to describe the knife in great detail. He even sketched a 9.2cm version of it on paper, although he knocked a few centimetres off its length. The two deepest injuries on Tambun Sim were 11 and 13 centimetres. On the sketch, he drew an intricate circular design on the side, an odd inclusion since the knife would have almost immediately become blooded. He was evidently familiar with this blade. And a search of Boon Sin's home found that no knives from the kitchen set were missing, nor were any of his fishing knives. Dr Gilbert Lau, who conducted the autopsies on both the father and son, was cross-examined, and it was put to him that the injuries could have been caused by self-defence. He rubbished the idea, saying, It would really beg the question why the assailant stabbed Mr Tambunsin not once, not twice, not thrice, but a total of twelve times. To me that would seem like quite an excessive form of self-defence. Iskander had also described how Tambunsin had charged at him with the blade, but the elderly man could barely walk properly. He had completely degenerated cartilage in his right knee, and was due to go for surgery in the upcoming weeks. He was much older and frailer than Iskander, and Chi Hyung was only half Iskander's size too. This made them unlikely aggressors, and people he almost certainly would have been able to escape from, particularly given his training in unarmed combat. As for the only defensive injury found on Iskander, the slice he received when trying to grab the knife from Boon Sin, the prosecution maintained that this likely occurred during the attack on Chi Hyung, and is precisely the type of accidental injury that can result from a frenzied attack when a blade's handle becomes bloodied and slippery. And let's not forget the sock prints found within the home. They didn't contain any of Chi Hyung's DNA, so Iskander must have wandered around the house to look for the valuables after he killed Boon Sin and before he killed his son. His mind was still on the money. After a nine-day trial, Iskandar bin Ramat was found guilty of the murder of Tan Boon Sin and Tan Chi Hyung. Justice Tae Yong Kwang rejected Iskandar's defence. He noted that he'd had ample opportunities to grab the money and run, but that never happened. It never happened because that was never the plan. The plan was always to make sure Boon Sin would never recognise him, and the only way to do that was to kill him. Boon Sin's murder was premeditated. Chi Hyung was collateral damage, killed to silence him for witnessing the murder of his father. On December 4th, 2015, Iskandar remained emotionless as Justice Tay passed the mandatory sentence of death by hanging. The judge commended the police officers in charge of the investigation for their part in the swift arrest of Iskandar and remaining unbiased despite the accused being a police officer. Iskandar went on to appeal the decision and this was unanimously dismissed in 2017, on his 38th birthday. Following this, he filed for clemency from the President of Singapore, but his plea was ultimately rejected in 2019, solidifying his death sentence. As of today, in March of 2023, he's out of options and remains on death row, waiting to be hanged. And that concludes the case of the Coven Killer. Whether or not you believe Iskander's version of events, it was basically the case of one desperate, senseless crime snowballing into, well, an even worse one. It's just bizarre, and such a shame for the Tan family. As always, let me know what you think about this one. I always read the comments. And if you found it interesting, sub, like, all that good stuff, and hopefully, I'll see you next time. 
tror jag. Mm. 